I'm Rick Edelman, and this is The Truth About Money. On today's show... And in a time of economic crisis, drinking is the answer. Do we hang on for the long term for our kids when we die 20 years from now? Oh, the hell with the kids. The big bull market for bonds is over. I don't care how much you're attached to that house, it does not love you back. Debt to me is evil, it's bondage, it's slavery, it, it just, it, it limits your choices, all kinds of debt. That's all coming up right here, right now, on The Truth About Money. Quick, name a stock that people like to own. We'll see if your answer matches what people on the street told us. Cisco, <laughs> at one time when it was actually doing well, but since then, not so well. AT&T. BP in Australia. I like to buy McDonald's. Very often they're buying brands and products that they know themselves. Stock that I invested in. Uh... I got a little, uh, little bank in mid-Michigan that, uh, that I'm feeling pretty good about. Jefferson Pilot. GM. I'm Coca-Cola. I'm going to say Bank of America because I work there. <laughs> I have one stock right now, one share with Bank of America. Microsoft. Okay. And Apple. Uh, yeah. uh, my family has some Coke stock. I think financial stocks are very popular and I think that they pretty much run the course of a good place to put your money is financial stocks. Alcohol stocks. No one will ever stop drinking. And in a time of economic crisis, drinking is the answer. You might assume that since I'm an investment advisor, I must like the idea of people owning stocks. But the truth might surprise you. Of course, I firmly believe that most people should own stocks as part of a long-term diversified portfolio. But I don't believe that you should own individual stocks. That's not investing. That's speculating. Do you really want to gamble your financial future or your child's ability to go to college because you bet on the right stock? Let me put it to you this way. Do you believe that the airline industry is here to stay? Well, that's a silly question, of course it is. But does that mean that any particular airline is secure? Go back to World War II. When the war ended, thousands of pilots left military service and they all wanted to join the new commercial airline industry. These veterans could pick any airline they wanted. And guess which airlines were the biggest back then? Pan Am, Eastern. Neither of those companies exists today, even though air travel has grown immeasurably. Well, how about the auto industry? In 1920, there were more than 200 manufacturers in the U.S. Today, there are three. Would you have been able to pick them? When you invest in an individual stock, you're making a big bet. You're betting that a single individual company will do well. The truth is, no matter how well you think you know a company, you can't know everything. It doesn't matter if you work there. It doesn't matter if you follow the company's news, and it doesn't matter if you love their products. Lots of things can happen to make a stock's price drop or for the company itself to go broke. Wall Street's graveyards are filled with big companies that all went bust. Lehman Brothers, Enron, WorldCom, Washington Mutual, Countrywide, IndyMac, the list goes on and on. All of these were among the biggest, most profitable companies in the world, and now they don't even exist. Don't bet on an airline stock. Invest in every airline stock. In fact, don't stop there. Invest in every stock of every industry. In fact, go beyond industry. Invest in every market sector. In fact, go beyond that. Invest in every stock of every market sector and every part of the entire globe. Sure, some of the individual stocks might go broke, but a lot of them will also make incredible profits. Diversification, of course, doesn't assure or guarantee better performance, can't eliminate the risk of investment losses. You will get, though, an average return that will help you achieve your goals, and you won't be gambling to do it. Our producer wanted what he says is the best pizza in the country. No, he's not from Chicago. He's from New York. Here's somebody he talked to while he was on the hunt for that pizza. Hi, Rick. Um, what would you recommend for young college kids that are struggling to work and to live and to somewhat have a life in the city? Because finances are a huge struggle and there doesn't really seem to be any outlet for help. Let me get this straight. You're in your early 20s, you're struggling to pay your bills, save for your future, and still have somewhat of a life? Wah. 
give me a break. You're only in your 20s. Things are doing just fine. You got a degree. You got a good job. You got your whole life ahead of you. You can't have it all, and you can't have it all right now. Get over it. Oh, by the way, you can have a life. That doesn't mean you have to spend a lot of money to go get it. There's a lot of free stuff in the city. My goodness gracious, you live in Manhattan for crying out loud. Everything is free in that city. Libraries are free. Parks are free. We need to get creative in our life. We need to recognize that you're not supposed to have it all in your 20s. What we need to do is do what we need to do. And that means saving for your future, recognizing the value of delayed gratification, putting money aside for your future because one day the future will be here and you'll be so glad that you did exactly that. Don't get discouraged. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep working hard and you'll be surprised how soon you're going to have everything you want. I have what you've been waiting for. The chance to take our quiz of the day. What is the penalty for failing to withdraw the correct amount from your IRA after you reach age 70 and a half? 10%, 15%, 25%, or 50%? Stay tuned for the answer. There's no doubt about it, I have a face for radio. Here's proof from my weekly live show. Well, I'm kind of one of those in a tough situation, and I have a feeling there's probably a lot more of us out there. Gone through the divorce, bankruptcy prior to the divorce to save the marriage, and I thought by keeping the house I would be doing a great favor for her. Ended up that I got the house back through the divorce. It's upside down at about $40,000. I have... Um, basically no uh, savings account because I was a self-employed designer builder, a contractor. I'm now broke. Um, went in with another company and I travel now all over the United States. Money is good, but I'm so far in debt or, or behind that I feel like, you know, you talk about people with $500,000 in savings and all that. I've got $2,000 in savings. Yeah. I've got a house that I really probably could just give back and that's where I'm kind of torn. Do I just give it back? start over, um, and I kind of wanted to throw the numbers out there and see what you can help me with. Yeah, I would say give back and start over. Yeah, it, it, at the, this point, with 2000 in savings and a house that's underwater, it's just going to be, it's a chain around your neck at you, this point. You are literally, Jim, at a fresh start. Uh, and you're at square one. You're, you're just starting out and just starting over. And there's no reason to have the ball and chain of prior uh, of your prior life. Uh, you don't have the spouse. There's no reason to keep the house. Uh, it's underwater, and you've already gone through bankruptcy, which means you're a horrific credit risk to anybody who wants to lend you money at this point going forward. So you should talk with the lender about doing a short sale so that they will forgive the amount of the loan uh, that is not covered by the sale of the property and start over with your life. Uh, it sounds like you've got a job now and you're off and running. So you've got plenty of time, not, not a huge amount. You know, I'm sure you're wishing that you were 25, but um, you've got your health and you've got your career and uh, you need to maximize both of those. Yeah. It's just, what's so frustrating is that house became this uh, emotional attachment yep. and it's hard to let that part go. And you're, you're right. Your observation is absolutely correct that houses are an extraordinarily emotional asset. Uh, so is a spouse and you uh, um, are no longer with the spouse and that had to be much more difficult emotionally than a house. At the end of the day, a house is just a thing. It's a material yeah. item. And let me tell you, I don't care how much you're attached to that house, it does not love you back. Well, there's a valid point. Get rid of it, my friend. Move on with your life. The penalty for failing to withdraw the correct amount from your IRA after you reach age 70 and a half is 50%. Questions that people ask me at our live seminars are probably the same questions you have on your mind. Take a look. I hope you can help us. My husband retired in January of this year. We inherited something we thought was wonderful in 2007, uh, which was a good lump of Maryland municipal bonds long term. And for a while, they just looked fabulous. They went up and up and up, and they paid this great dividend. And now they're 20% of our portfolio. We're in a low income tax bracket, and 
we don't know whether to hang on to them. We're using the dividends for additional income, which we do need. So can you give suggestions? Do we hang on for the long term for our kids when we die 20 years from now? Oh, the hell with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's worry about you. Okay. Um, you said 20% of your portfolio are now in these bonds. Where's the other 80%? Uh, here and there and everywhere. Uh, we have some cash. You know, I bought some here the other day, and it just didn't work out very well. Um, so you own a, a whole bunch of other stuff. We sure do. Uh, you own other bonds in the portfolio? Other kinds of bonds? Government bonds, perhaps? Um, I need those bonds you buy the long, <laughs> the treasury bonds, and yeah, he likes all that stuff. What percentage of the portfolio is in bonds overall? Thirty percent, and the rest of it's in equities. Yes. Okay. Um, so if you've got, it, it's interesting. The reason I'm, I'm asking the question of what about the total money is that in one way we can argue that with twenty percent of your portfolio in muni bonds, who cares? It's only twenty percent of the portfolio. Even if it went broke, you still have eighty percent of your money left, and that's why I'm very concerned about the eighty percent, even more so than the twenty percent. But that doesn't mean I, I really am totally cavalier about the muni bonds themselves. Your experience is quite accurate. Several years ago, with where interest rates were, muni bonds did pretty well, especially when the credit crisis hit in 2008, because nobody wanted to own stocks at that point. Everybody went to what's called a flight to safety. When we're fearful of an economic collapse, we buy government guaranteed bonds, and Maryland municipal bonds are in that category. So as you noticed, their value held up very nicely. They even grew in value a little bit. The income was very regular. Every six months you got dividend checks, and life was good. Well, here we are some time later, and the value of those bonds has declined, and you're wondering what's going to happen next. The short answer is this. We are not a fan of municipal bonds in this economic environment, and there are two reasons that we say this. The first is due to interest rates, and this message applies not just to municipal bonds, but bonds of all kinds. I'm talking about government bonds, U.S. Treasuries, I'm talking about municipal bonds, also corporate bonds, junk bonds, international bonds. A bond is a bond is a bond, and we don't like them in this economic environment. And what am I talking about? What economic environment is that? I'm not talking about the global stock market scenario. I'm not talking about natural disasters. I'm not talking about political problems or debt crises or any of that. I'm talking about the interest rate environment. Where are interest rates right now? Would you say that they're relatively high or relatively low? They're low. They're low. Interest rates right now are remarkably low, aren't they? In fact, at the time we're talking about this, they are near historic lows. Think back 30 years ago. Think back to 1980. Anybody here old enough to remember 1980, 81, 82? Where were interest rates back then? Did anybody buy a house in 1980 or thereabouts? Do you remember the mortgage interest rate that you paid? 15 and a half percent on a mortgage. Anybody pay more than that? How much? I paid uh, 17 on a second. You paid 17 percent on a second mortgage. Anybody pay more than that? Well, give him a round of applause for being the. I think there's a. Uh, I think there's another television show called The Biggest Loser. Um, he's like, yeah, I got 17. Beat that. <laughs> and so, uh, but actually, you were thrilled to get the 17 because you knew next month it was going to 18. And quick, give me the 17 percent while I still can. This was what it was like in 1980, 81, 82, and then something miraculous happened. The economy began to recover. The 70s were over. Oil prices were no longer sky high. We didn't have an oil embargo anymore. Do you remember the days where you were in line to buy gasoline? Every other day, based on your license plate, they let you buy five gallons? Those days were over. The hostages from Iran had come home. The economy was beginning to resurge, and interest rates began coming down. So we went from 18% interest rates in 1980 to virtually zero today. Mortgage rates right now are under 5%, the lowest level for mortgage rates ever. Which means if your personal investment career is 30 years or less, 
Think back to when you first bought your first investment. Think back to when you first started paying attention to interest rates. If it's 30 years or less, the only experience you have personally is an environment where interest rates kept coming down. Now, why does that matter? It's real simple. Interest rates are part of a seesaw. Interest rates are over here. You know how seesaws work, right? They work like this. Here are interest rates on one end of the seesaw. What's on the other end? Bond prices. So if interest rates were high and came down, what, what happened to bond values? They went up. But today, the world is different. Today, our seesaw is this. Interest rates are down here. Which way are interest rates going to go in the future? They're going to go back up. And when they go back up, what's going to happen to the value of bonds? They're going to go down, which means the big bull market for bonds is over, gone, done. And what we're now about to experience is a massive sea change, a generational change, one that we only see every 20 or 30 years. People who own long-term bonds today are about to find themselves losing a substantial amount of money over the next 5 and 10 and 15 years. For that reason, we are not a fan of long-term bonds. So if your bonds are government guaranteed, I don't think you have to worry about it too much. You mentioned Maryland as the bonds you own. That's better than a lot of others. Maryland is one of the few states that's highly rated. They're in better financial shape than many other states, but they're not immune. So we're not terribly thrilled about long-term muni bonds at this point, and would argue that you can get the returns you're looking for, the income you need, with a much higher degree of safety and liquidity than what you're currently doing. And where would that be? Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Last week we were talking with Michelle Singletary, columnist of The Color of Money for The Washington Post and now syndicated in more than 100 newspapers around the country. We we're having so much fun talking with her that we're going to present to you right now part two of our conversation with Michelle Singletary. Welcome back to the program, Michelle. Oh, thank you. There are some fundamental themes that you like to preach on uh, over time. Talk about what a couple of those major messages are. Um, the biggest one, which I get shots at from all, all the time, is debt debt. I'm a no debt kind of person. I believe you should not take on debt for anything. Anything. Now. And that's the one subject where we disagree. Right. Because there's one thing that right. I'll have an exception to, which we'll mention later. Right. So I say that because I know I'm way over here. And, and people I know, are going to say, you tell me I got to pay cash for a car? That's right. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying pay cash. There's only one thing that we have to borrow for if you want a beast, and that's a homeowner. Which because, is the one item that I'm okay with. Right. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. I don't like it. I don't embrace it. I don't think it's a good thing, but I'm okay with it. Simply because there's not much choice. Because there's not much choice. So you're realistic. I'm very realistic. But talk about a car, because that's a twenty or $40,000 expense. But it does not have to be. Why? I, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, when you look at people's budgets, now I work with people one-on-one -on -one, um, through a ministry in my church, and so I see people's budgets up close and personal all the time. The second biggest item on their budget Cost. Not saving, right. not investing, right. not putting their kids through college is a car, a car, a car, <laughs> where you drive off the lot, and the minute you drive off the lot, you've lost 30% value, a car. I'm looking at two couples with, you know, $1,000, $1,500 car payments, and they're talking about, well, we can't have no money to save for our kids' college, and why doesn't the government... You got $1,500 a month for the car payment. <laughs> Yes, you should save for a car. But to you, it's incredibly obvious. It is so fundamental, so basic, and yet they're oblivious to this concept. And oblivious. I mean, you spend four years paying a car note because I think if you're going to get a car note, it should be no more than 48 months. Then why can't you spend four years saving up to pay cash for it? Or keep the car you have for a number of years, service it, and then save up, make a car payment to yourself. This is something I learned from my grandmother. You know, when you get a four-year car loan, then after that, keep making that car payment to yourself. But you know what my favorite is? Is when someone says to me that they're buying buying a new car, and I say, why? They say, because it's, my car's kind of old and right. it needs about $2,000 worth of repairs. So they're gonna spend 30 grand right. to avoid it's, spending right. tw two grand. It's crazy. Debt to me is evil, it's bondage, it's slavery, it, it just, it, it limits your choices, all kinds of debt, especially student loan debt. That's my big thing right now. Talk I, about I, that. Oh my gosh. To me, that is the next bu bubble. 
I mean, I, the amount of money people are borrowing to go to school is just incredible. Is the answer to not go to college? The answer is not to go to college. It's to think differently about how to go to college. You're, you cannot give your kid a blank check and say, you apply to any school you want, baby. We'll figure out how to pay for it. That is crazy to me. I mean, in my mind, it's crazy. And I understand that you want the best for your child. But if you start by the premise of zero debt, you'll make different choices. And in fact, we have to define what best is because best doesn't mean graduating from the Ivy League. That's it exactly means right. getting your child off on the right foot when right. they graduate at all. That's exactly right. Community college, stay at home, in state. Does that mean, now I've told my daughter who wants to be a teacher, you can apply to any school you want, Harvard, Yale, I don't care. If they, you don't get enough scholarships and we don't have enough saved, you can't go. And people will look at me, well, where's she getting to Harvard? You have to send her, you have to send her. No, I do not have to send her. I went to a state school, got a great education, working for one of the greatest newspapers in the you country. You turned out just fine. And I turned okay, and the guy sitting next to me went to Harvard. So we're both at the post, yes. having gotten different education values, and we're still, we're both doing well. Uh, I've often argued that an average kid who goes to a great school will be average in life. Exactly. But a great kid who right. goes to an average school will have a great life. Absolutely. It's all about the child. It's all about the child. It's all about the motivation. And I think, and I think you set them up for a life of debt when you say, we'll figure out how to do it later. Then how do you then come back with authenticity and say, don't borrow for a car, or don't buy too much house, or don't use credit card debt? Now let's 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 assume here, Michelle. You're you're very motivational. You're very inspirational, and that's why your column is so popular and your books are so successful. You've now convinced everybody who's watching this conversation. They realize the error of their ways, and they recognize that that expensive car with the big monthly payment is not in their best interest. This gargantuan house with a massive mortgage is not going to help them achieve their financial goals, and they want to fix it. They want to change. Right. How? What do they do? You have to have a plan, a purpose. This is something I learned from my grandmother. You have to write down right now, if you're watching this, you know, every penny ought to have a purpose. And what that means is, what do you want to do with your life? What do you, you're working and you're doing all this, what do you want to do with that? Then when you have that plan, it's easy to say no to this stuff. Right? Well, it's not that you're saying no, it's not that you're refusing to buy, you're simply choosing to buy something that really does matter. That's exactly right, that's exactly right. You, you, you have a purpose for that. I'm not saying don't ever buy a new car, I bought a new car, I pay cash for it. I'm not saying don't buy clothes, if that's your thing, that's fine, but you can't buy a car and have clothes and have a big house and send your kid to a college, you can't, you can't do it all. So this is your pot, you decide what you're going to put in this pot, and then everything else gets tossed I remember up. counseling uh, one individual, and he was, like you just said, going through the budget, not having enough money to do it all, and, and didn't have enough money for everything. And I said, it's not a problem. Just say to your son when he's ready to go to college, sorry, son, you can't right. go to college because we've been watching HBO. Exactly. That's exactly right. Texting and, and, and calling people. And I said, listen, I'm not telling you not to have a cell phone, but recognize when you're spending $180 to $200 on this data plan for this phone, that's $200 that can go into a college fund. And at the time when it comes to sending them to college, college, are you going to say, you know what, we text and talked your money away, sorry. I'll tweet you, you know, when you get to campus, you know. It's just about choices. That's what I'm talking about. Michelle, thank you so much. You're welcome. It's so good to be with you all the time. Uh, I'm Rick Edelman. This has been an interview with Michelle Singletary of the Washington Post. You can get information on Michelle's column. Go to thetruthaboutmoneytv.com to learn more about Michelle Singletary. Before we go, take your pick. You can either figure out how to invest your 401k or you can have dinner with your in-laws. Which would you rather do? Well, according to an industry survey, most people would rather spend an evening with the in-laws than have to deal with choosing investments. But investing doesn't have to be so intimidating. If you feel overwhelmed by investment decisions, just talk with an independent, objective, fee-based advisor. At our website, thetruthaboutmoneytv.com, you can find complete information on the 18 questions you should ask when hiring an advisor. The information's free and will help you find the advisor who's right for you. That's thetruthaboutmoneytv.com. And that's it for this TV edition of The Truth About Money. I'm Rick Edelman. Thanks for watching. Vicki, come on, let's go out of here. Come on.